composition. And I also have taught um, a lot of multilingual students. And so my learning and teaching experiences have been very a very clear, straightforward path. But through all of it, I really realized that learning about teaching and becoming a better teacher is a journey that really starts with the soul and learning how to connect with people at, at the very basis of what we do as teachers is learn how to connect with other people and listen and communicate well. And then on top of that, there are actual skills and strategies you can use to become a better teacher and instructor. And I really feel that in the last 10 years, as I've been honing my craft and developing these different techniques and going to workshops, uh, my growth has really been very apparent in teaching. So today, I'm hoping to share some of these tips, tricks, and tools with you. And I have built a, a folder, and I'm going to throw that into chat right now, actually. Let me pull this up. So let me grab the folder link. So I've built a folder and it is full of different um, research material, research articles, as well as actual templates for different assignments. I also put into that um, some journal prompts I've been doing right now. I feel that students are really struggling with mental health. So I've put together some journal prompts and activities that can be done in like five minutes in a class period to kind of help with mental health. Um, so I believe you should have access to this pretty full um, links to, links to all sorts of things in these folders. And if you don't, let me know. But um, I think it's useful to come to these presentations and actually walk, walk away with something like concrete. Oops, hit the wrong button, sorry. So there's that folder for you. All right, so to start with, I really want us to talk about what we think when we think of the idea of student success. And as a quick overview, we're going to talk about student success and then strategies for student success, brainstorm ways of connecting that into our own work, and then end with self-care, because this is particularly important, especially in this time of COVID. So what are some specific things that come to mind when you hear the term student success? If you could please type something into chat, we'll open up the chat and kind of look at this. So the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the term student success. Academic confidence. Good grades. Ability to apply content to an actual case study, that application part of it. Learning. A sense of belonging development and growth of actual skills, concrete development and growth, achieving something they didn't think they would be able to. I love that. It's so true. Retention. Yes, that's a measurement, a clear measurement we can look at to see if we're being successful as teachers, for sure. Reflect a perspective on their work, trying and failing again. These are all wonderful definitions of student success. And I want us to think a little bit more about student success. So we kind of have come up with a definition of it, but then in your own class, so you have your own idea of what success looks like. How are you actually measuring this success? And do our measurements align with our notion of success? So I want you to spend a minute really thinking about this. Like, how are you measuring student success? What does it look like? And is everything aligning in your classes? So you can do this as a free write if you want. I'm a writing instructor, so I like to think and write, or you can just do it mentally. And I'm gonna be setting up some breakout rooms. We're gonna move into breakout rooms, right, to get things started. Um, and we'll be talking about this notion of student success in the breakout rooms. So start thinking about these three topics as I set up the breakout rooms. All right, I'm going to move you into a breakout room. Your spokesperson is going to be the person that woke up earliest today. So you can figure that out in your breakout rooms. We will have six different rooms. Um, and so we'll come back and we'll kind of share what our groups talked about. We'll have six different spokespeople, if we have time. We may not get to everyone, but we'll, we'll have some sharing. And so here are the three questions and I will also put these into chat in the breakout room time. What do you want your students to remember? How do you measure success and what is success? So really the conversation you're just thinking about. Are there any questions as I put you into breakout rooms? 
All right, I'll put you into rooms. Figure out who woke up earliest this morning. They'll be your spokesperson and you'll be in the breakout room for five minutes. The room should be open. Jack, I'm putting you into room three. Ken, I just put you into room three or just gave you an assignment to room three. Kent, it looks like it's having a hard time letting you in, I'm sorry.
Welcome back. Brandon, looks like you're in your car. <laughs> That's awesome. It's great with Zoom, you can attend anywhere. It's pretty transformational. All right, welcome back everyone. There were some great conversations I can tell because it took people a while to come back, which is always a good sign. So we'll go around and share some of the um, ideas or conversations that came out of the rooms. We'll start with breakout room one with had Kristen and Tony and RB in it. Um, I don't know who your spokesperson was, but if one of you would be willing to share briefly, like in a minute or so, kind of what you talked about in your group. So we actually didn't figure out who got up earlier, but I'm gonna bet that I did because I'm east of ah. <laughs> so, um, but we talked, we actually talked a lot. So Kristen's in a community college. I'm in a small liberal arts, a four year small liberal arts college. Um, and so we talked about the ways that there are kind of, there can be on the surface different definitions of success from the community college level versus people who think of their institutions as more selective, right? And then thinking about ways to undermine, like to push back against that for faculty, like, um, how do we all have a similar definition of success that involves, you know, actually everybody getting a chance to, to move to whatever level they want to move to, to get what they need from the classroom? How do we, how do we build a more equitable, how do we get people on board with a more equitable idea about what success actually is? Um, so that doesn't allow for certain people to fail. So. I think that's so important because this really is a conversation about equity. Like you can't have a, a conversation about success and the, the, what it looks like without really asking about equity. Thank you. Group two, you Tammy and John and um, So in our group, we talked that we had lots of different disciplines. So someone who teaches sewing, Shaylin mentioned like the actual product that they create is, also, is often a, um, an indicator of success. And then um, in biology, mentioning like application as an indicator of success. So how um, capable students are of applying what they've learned in biology to the other fields or the other um, classes that they go into. And then in English, we talked about student um, kind of student dialogue or students reflecting or somehow indicating what they've done. Um, and so that might be with um, talking about how much time they spent on homework and, and us as instructors believing just, okay, if that's how much time you spent, then that you like, so it's kind of self-reporting almost by students. Nice. And due to time, I don't think we're gonna get through all the groups. Is there a group that really wanted to share a point or is there, we could, we could skip to, if there's someone who really wants to share something. We mainly talked about measurement um, in our group and how we measure those things and how reflection, like the students reflection on their own learning is really, really important to their own success. And so we talked about a lot of our, um, kind of our, the ways we, we ask students to reflect and kind of measure, not necessarily on right or wrong, but on what they've learned on what they are doing. Yeah, I love that. That reflective part of learning is so important. It's iterative and it's imperative to like being able to connect that in order to learn. So any last thing before we kind of move on? These are all wonderful conversations. I, I would like to think that the assessment framework uh, kind of gives you clarity in terms of what you're looking for. And so based on your assessment framework, you can determine the degree to which the student knows the material or the knowledge gaps that are revealed as a result of the performance. Yeah, and I was lucky enough to attend Jack's earlier presentation about like backwards design and Jack is really quite quite experienced with this assessment framework and making it all all align, which is really difficult to do. And when you're doing it well, it's amazing when it all works out. So yeah, so moving on to kind of some tips and tricks, like some actual strategies we can employ. And I'm sure all of you are using a number of these. I'm hoping that maybe some of them will be new to you or just remind you of something you already know. And again, I have templates and articles about these all shared in that folder with you. So here are some actual strategies. This is sort of an overview of the strategies we'll cover. But really thinking about a cruelty-free syllabus our entire semester, transparent assignment designs, flexible assignment deadlines, wise feedback, retention alerts, um, and really universal design for learning, which starts there at the, the entire approach to learning. 
So the syllabus, the cruelty-free syllabus, there's a lot of research around that and some experts in this. Matthew Shaney wrote, a lot of my work, a lot of my career, and a lot of the moments that were the most tense were moments where I had forgotten to trust students. And I think this happens sometimes. We, we forget. It's happened to all of us. We forget to trust that our students are often there trying their hardest. And uh, in the syllabus, it's a legal document. I'm given six pages of legalese that has to be in my syllabus. And so there's always kind of this tension between that firm line as well as like having a welcoming environment. And so really looking at the language that you're using around maybe these, um, these rules that you have that are there to create an environment where students really can be successful. Kind of thinking about sort of that line that you're walking with your syllabus is a great, a great way to start and a great place to start. And um, Matthew Cheney has a really interesting podcast in teaching in higher ed about the syllabus, cruelty free, free syllabi, and lots of people have written about this. In my own class, I actually have my legal version, and I've tried to change the language so it's pretty positive in there, but then I have a little pamphlet that I make, and I hand that out when we're in person, the pamphlet. And I know lots of other people have done like games and all sorts of different things with their syllabi to create, make them a little more accessible and inviting to students. Sorry. The other thing that I really think is so important is looking at the way your class is designed. So Carol Dweck and her research on growth mindset has been out for the last 10 years. And we're starting to see kind of the results of that. There's some studies looking at the results um, of her research. But Gr Carol Dweck's a basic fundamental approach to learning is that learning is a process and something that we can all get better at. And it really is our mindset that informs how we learn. And for me, I wish I had encountered Carol Dweck's work as I was in grad school because I was what I would consider extremely talented in writing or I had always been told I was a talented writer. So when I got into a fiction grad program and everyone else was equally talented or more talented, I had a really hard time uh, taking feedback, learning how to learn, knowing how to revise because it was my identity was being attacked. I felt in these kind of this critique workshop and I really was held back because I didn't have a growth mindset about my own writing. I was perfectionistic and really shut down. And I think um, recognizing growth mindset and Carol Dweck's work is really important because we all have growth mindset in certain parts of our life and kind of a fixed mindset in other parts of our life. So I really use growth mindset as a groundwork in my classes and always bring in Carol Dweck's work and have students really spend some time thinking about where they have a growth mindset, particularly tied to education and to the topic that I'm teaching. And I find that to be, you know, five minutes of growth mindset can really set the tenor for the entire class. Also, this leads into a flexible grading um, schedule as well as a grade contract. So I've been doing a lot of work around equity and inclusion. And part of this is the way we look at a finished product. And I am in an English department. I'm writing, you know, my classes are composition classes. So I think this works particularly well in a composition classroom where students invariably kind of feel that there's a lot of bias and um, professors have sort of things that they value in writing and it can be really murky or unclear to students. And so instead of grading Grading their writing based on the quality of the writing, I grade their writing based on their labor. So the labor is measured and they do a certain amount of work to get to an A, a certain amount of work to get to a B, a certain amount of work to get to a C. That usually just happens because our life falls apart. But there's sort of these pathways. And I really was drawn to flexible grading and great contracts um, because I started to teach multilingual students. And I would notice that some of my multilingual students were working so hard, but their end product really wasn't at the place that I assumed an end product should be. And it made me really reconsider what I was valuing and what I was rewarding and what my concept of success actually was. And in many ways, by having this idea of this like perfect paper that they were trying to achieve, I was really not recognizing their labor or work that they were putting into the class or giving them different avenues towards success. So this really ties into universal design for learning as well. And um, my, my teaching multilingual students really made me back and think, how can I create a classroom where I have um, students from who are native speakers and who are not native speakers and create an intercultural class where the dialogue, um, people are able to actually learn from each other rather than have this like 
idea that English is superior and trying to get to this superior end format. So universal design for learning, as many of you have probably looked at, there's so much there that helps you kind of unpack the types of assignments you're doing or how you're, how you're setting up assignments, who they're privileging, who they're not. There's always some sort of unspoken group that's being privileged with an assignment and sort of unpacking that and recognizing what it's privileging. Sometimes privilege is not necessarily a bad thing, like we want to privilege certain things, but I think recognizing what we're doing when we do it is important. So universal design for learning, I put some more information in the packet on it, there's a lot there around it and a lot of different assignments and ways of thinking. But a quick example for UDL would be that you would have multiple formats that students could select from. So if they are writing a paper, they might do a presentation or a film instead, um, as long as you're reaching the learning outcomes. So it's more learning outcomes focused and then working backwards, often through choice. Uh, so that's a little bit on UDL, there's so much there. <laughs> So a concrete way of trying to make my classes more accessible to students has been to do some distinct changes. So one thing I did was um, I adopted um, this assignment design template um, from Mary Ann Winklems, and she comes out of UNL, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And actually I have, I'll grab the link really quickly for you. It's in our shared folder, but here's also the link which I'll put into into chat, but I've been using this assignment. I rewrote last semester, I rewrote all my assignment sheets using this assignment design. And I have been so impressed at how few questions I get now about my rather lengthy, lengthy assignment sheets. First of all, my assignment sheets went from being like three pages long to more like one page and less is truly more, <laughs> or at least in my case, less has been more for my students. And they have really um, responded to these assignment sheets and there's some research around Around, using these assignment sheets for supporting student learning. And there's different sections on there. The section they most look at is how is this graded, like criteria for success. They spend a lot of time looking at that. Um, so it's been very helpful for me to kind of rethink my assignments, just the assignment sheet alone. Um, another tip that is pretty popular right now, and there's been research around it as well as WISE Feedback. So WISE Feedback is a format for giving feedback to students that um, is couched in a certain way. And so the WISE Feedback template is basically, I have high standards. This is what you did in your assignment. So sort of a summary of what they did and places where they could probably improve. And then assurance of student ability. And the studies around WISE feedback have really linked that um, this works for students who aren't necessarily super confident in their ability. So if you reassure them in an authentic way that you're sure they're capable of meeting the assignment requirements, even though your expectations are high, they have evidence that there's actual growth, like students are able to take the feedback and apply it um, in a critical manner, the manner you hope that they're applying feedback. So this WISE feedback, I included a couple examples um, and some articles about wise feedback in the folder I shared with you. And it can be a little difficult like to get into this. I find that sometimes, you know, I have kind of my canned thing that I want to submit with students assignments when I'm grading 100 reading responses. So at times, like I might skim through certain things, but if I see certain students are struggling, I might take the time for my students that I'm most concerned about to do a little bit more wise feedback with. So sort of have a variety of how I'm approaching grading so that I can survive my grade load, but also be really supportive to those students. Another tip or trick that is very, is pretty simple is just, um, really like noticing when students students are struggling so in our lms system they have a um, an alert notice and i don't know about your lms system but basically when students are absent reaching out to them in a personal way and it's really useful if you pick before the semester starts kind of how many times like okay after two absences i'm going to reach out to every student so kind of in your mind no i'm reaching out to students or after each big project i'm going to look in my grade book see who's not doing well and reach out to them and uh, with these um emails that you send to students they uh they need to be personalized so they need to not be kind of a blank hey you didn't you know do your assignment but kind of like hey i noticed you were absent or i noticed you haven't turned in all your work um how's it going kind of have that personal 
put templates in the folder on like ways you could word those emails. You don't have to use those. Obviously it's better if it comes from you, but I have, I really do this conscientiously with students and reach out to them and they open up, they explain what's going on. And I've had a great deal of success with students recovering and pulling back into the class when they start to disappear by just being conscientious and reaching out before it gets too far down the line, before I've lost track of them. And I have a hundred students a semester, so it takes some time, but I've noticed that if I like pick the set times in the semester when I'm reaching out, it really helps me stay on top of it, not get behind with those students that are struggling. And right now with COVID, oh my word, this semester, there, it's really, I mean, you're all experiencing it. Like that reaching out, that personal touch is really important. Students are really struggling. Also, um, Sarah Goldrick-Rab came and spoke to our university. She's from Temple University, and she's doing a lot of research and work around student retention and success and, and our whole system, basically supporting students. And um, she did an, a study on reaching out to students. And so she has some empirical data that shows that retention rates really improve with reaching out to students with something as simple as an email. So, so the other aspect is building reflection and connection to the class. We, we were talking about that in your groups, which I'm so glad you brought up. And I think that this reflection connection is really important. Um, I ended up building a form after my last class. So last semester was the first time I used it. And right at the end of class, I would have students go into a Google form um, and they would build, I had this rubric that they would fill out and it's super simple. It's like, what did you learn today? And you can do this in an exit ticket format or you can do it in all sorts of different formats. I'll put it into share my format and you're welcome to use it or change it. In retrospect, I probably should have put the learning outcomes <laughs> more clearly in that format. Sometimes I feel like, University learning outcomes turn students off, but um, it would be nice if they reflected more clearly to their learning outcomes. But I'll throw this um, form into chat because I think it is useful for students. And then at the very end of my class, I have a writing class, they actually did a big reflective like cover letter about what they were learning with their portfolios. And they were able to take their weekly reflections and um, embed those into a larger paper. But I think whatever class you're doing, those exit tickets or those like reflections, what did you learn today? It just really emphasizes this idea that you're here, you're learning, and um, it, you have to do that work to make that connection, like that reflection is such an integral part to learning. So pulling it all together, we have different strategies that you can use, and it all really does start with kind of backwards design, like really thinking, what are my learning outcomes? How do I look at my assignments? How do I backwards design the entire class? Um, how do I have universal design for learning? So these larger philosophical approaches to teaching tie into the way we're able to build collaboration and community. Um, from the syllabus to the actual assignments that we choose, the different options students have for assignments. Another tip that I forgot, I skimmed over, but when I have students turn in work, so I teach writing and the essays are large, so I get really overwhelmed with grading. So I've ended up um, having a graduated assignment deadline because it takes me two weeks to grade 100 essays. So I have people sign up for their deadline for the essay. And so they pick the day that they're turning their essay in over a two week period. And I've actually moved to grading the essays directly with them. So we meet together in Zoom or in person. And then I open up the essay, we read it together and we fill out the grade rubric together. And it's been really beneficial because my conversation around their essay becomes a conversation. It's about learning and thinking about writing. Um, not everyone loves this technique, but for me, having a different deadline, at least a graduated deadline where people choose when they're going to turn turn in their work and I choose then I commit to grading it at that time it allows me to not be grading at like two in the morning because it's spread out over two weeks and I have the time built into my into my schedule to grade so that's been one of those management things that makes me a better teacher students feel like they're getting instant feedback and I'm I'm having a better work-life balance because <laughs> otherwise grading grading can be really hard to have a work-life balance with so moving on to a really important topic, which is self-care, having a work-life balance and finding ways of creating community and really caring about your student, but also having those boundaries where you're able to fill yourself up and not get so burned out that you are able to care for your students is so important. I think particularly now we're all, I don't know about you, but I have like an eye twitch from being on Zoom for 
many hours a day. So um, COVID is really highlighting finding balance, um, particularly with technology in our life. I love this quote by Audre Lorde. She says, I have come to believe that caring for myself is not self-indulgent. Caring for myself is an act of survival. And it's so true. It's truly um, a gift to everyone around you. So I want us to quickly brainstorm. What is a one feasible thing you can do to fill your own cup so that you can make changes to your class to improve student success? So one thing for you and one thing for your course. And I want you to think about it. And then we'll go ahead and throw some of these ideas up into chat. Actually, we have time. I'm gonna put us into breakout rooms. So start thinking about this. I'll put us back into breakout rooms and we'll have some conversations about things we can actually do to fill ourselves up as well as our students. And you might already have some fabulous ideas that I didn't cover, I'm sure you do, that you can share with one another. So I will get these breakout rooms set up. So oh, we've only got two oh. minutes left. Oh, never mind. We only have two minutes, got the time wrong. So we'll not put it in a breakout room. If anyone wants to throw into chat, that would be awesome. And yes. So if anyone has some ideas, being in nature, yes, teaching in nature. I always take my classes outside and teach in nature whenever we're in person. More reflection, those are really good ideas. Um, taking technology breaks, going out for a walk. One thing that I've noticed is I have Zoom class, you know, I end up Zoom scheduling myself so I don't ever have a break. So starting to schedule in breaks or defensively scheduling out my calendar a week in advance, like, oh, when am I going to take a break? When am I going to take a walk in the day? Um, getting more sleep, so important. Choosing which assignments I want to give a lot of feedback on and which ones I allow myself to breeze through. That's so important because you can get caught up in these little reading responses and, and be really burned out by the time you get to the end. Fun time with family and asking students to do the same. We're all people, including your students, and that work-life balance is important for everyone. I think emphasizing that is really important. I put into um, the folder some journal prompts that kind of emphasize like how to work with anxiety or things like that, but kind of get to that work-life balance as well. Yes, involving students more in the grading process. I It's been like really a life changer in my classes to have students grade with me, as well as fill out the rubric before we sit down and then we grade the paper together. They really start to understand the learning process um, of grading and that conversation. So lots of wonderful ideas. Thank you everyone for sharing and participating and to have that work-life balance <laughs> as you go out. Great. Thank right. you, Elizabeth, for that really interesting presentation and so many tips and strategies. I dropped into the chat two different links. That first link is a feedback link, just so we can check in on how things are going with the sessions. Are you finding them, getting lost, et cetera. And then the second one is to the Mighty Links app, where I did um, paste the, the resources that you gave us. Perfect. Elizabeth, I put those in there. So if people get off of this and want to find it later, that you can do that. Perfect. So with that, we'll say thank you. One, did you have something else, Elizabeth? Oh, I'll just put my email in as well. So if anyone wants to contact me, I'm totally available. I'll put that in. You might put that on the Mighty Networks um, and we can continue our conversations there. So right. thanks everyone. I hope everyone takes a minute to eat, talking about self-care, right? Walk around, right. get some food before we listen to um, James, Lang James, Lang James Langs's keynote in about 20 minutes. So I'll see you all there. Take care. Bye.